Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, do not fear, I am not here to give another lecture. <laughs> Rather, I am here to help end the formal part of the evening's festivities with a brief ceremony, hence the monkey suit. <laughs> the Oriental Institute Museum has a new exhibition on prehistory, which some of us have seen and some of us will see in a few minutes. Rightly enough, that exhibit focuses on our knowledge of the food producing revolution in the Near East and emphasizes the remarkable contributions which the University of Chicago and the Oriental Institute have made to the study of the first farmers and herdsmen in history. The work of Robert J. Braidwood is central to that Chicago contribution and I have no doubt is certainly now well known to an audience drawn from the Institute's family. What some of you may not know is that this year Bob Braidwood is 75 years old. Mind you, you wouldn't know it to look at him or to read his latest reports from the field, but it is true. Four years ago, a group of scholars joined together in an, in an effort to anticipate Bob's being 75 in a manner appropriate to the event. I am here before you tonight to present to Professor Braidwood in their name the result of that effort, a book of 18 articles which deal with the Neolithic Revolution and related matters written in his honor by some of his students, his friends, and his professional colleagues. In short, though the actual book is not short, a festschrift. In tribute tonight to Bob, permit me to share with you some excerpts from the introduction of that festschrift. Quote, a full biographical essay or scholarly appraisal of Bob Braidwood would be out of place and in any case premature. He is, after all, only 75. Rather, we, and in this case that is the true editorial and not the royal we, should like to muse in a somewhat impressionistic manner, we thought that was a very good Braidwoodian technique, <laughs> on four specific aspects of his contribution thus far. First, his undoubted pioneering efforts to direct archaeological attention to the study of the food producing or Neolithic revolution. Uh, sorry, Bob, about the tenacious neo grecism Second, his contribution to the difficult and often frustrating task of develop developing multidisciplinary research in prehistoric studies, that iron fist in the velvet glove business. Third, his influence on the discipline of anthropology, but more importantly, on the public's understanding of that discipline. And fourth, his impact on students of ancient languages and theology working on the historic Near East." End quote. Now, I do not wish tonight to expand on Braidwood's contribution under the first three of these areas of endeavor. In due time, you can all read the book's introduction after buying the book in the souk, of course. Instead, because this is the Oriental Institute, and because we have gathered tonight as friends of that institute in part, it is altogether fitting and proper that I quote further from the introduction to Bob's book on the subject of his influence on others who study the ancient Near East. Quoting again, of all the scholars beyond the confines of anthropology and prehistory, those who study the ancient Near East in post prehistoric times have probably been the most influenced by Braidwood's work. Part of this is no doubt due to his having had a joint appointment at Chicago in anthropology and the Oriental Institute. His office was in the Institute, he taught classes in the building, he shared lab space with other archaeologists. Thus he is personally known to many of the philologists and historic archaeologists who have been the Institute's strength since it was founded by Braidwood. And they, being distinguished savants of the wider world of ancient Near Eastern studies, helped Braidwood to spread the word to many who might not otherwise have had the slightest interest in anything that happened at Jericho before Joshua is said to have blown it down. 
More important, however, are Braidwood's articles and lectures published and given outside the scholarly channels normally used by prehistorians and anthropologists. To a considerable extent, Braidwood is responsible, in North America at least, for the interest that Near Eastern historians have come to evince over the past 30 years in events that happened before 4000 BC, and for the importance now attached by those same historians to pre-literate periods. More or less at random, we plucked two histories of the ancient Near East off a library shelf. A. Leo Oppenheim, in his Ancient Mesopotamia, Portrait of a Dead Civilization, has a section, albeit brief, on the background, in which he men mentions botanists and zoologists, of all things, and uses strange phrases such as centers of domestication, lines of diffusion, and the study of transition, and then footnotes Braidwood's prehistoric investigations. W. W. Hallow, the cuneiformist, and W. K. Simpson, the Egyptologist, in their book, The Ancient Near East, A History, go even further. They entitle a whole chapter, The Near East to the End of the Stone Age, which begins with a section headed Introduction, Half of History. Bob Braidwood is again well footnoted. We suggest that had either of those two works and others like them been written 25 years ago, prehistory probably would have been ignored. As a case in point, note the following contrast. Whereas Hallow and Simpson are willing to give seven pages to the Paleolithic period alone, Breasted, in his History of Egypt, says they, Paleolithic men, cannot be connected in any way with the historic or prehistoric civilizations of the Egyptians, and they fall exclusively within the province of the geologist and the anthropologist. Prehistory has become a respectable subject in ancient Near Eastern studies, and Braidwood has been a leader of those responsible for this felicitous development. So, in 1982, Robert J. Braidwood is 75 years old. To a prehistorian's way of thinking, that's not many years. It's uh, really nothing more than a most acceptable standard deviation on a first-class radiocarbon date. <laughs> Yet it is fair to say that Braidwood's career as a prehistorian did not begin in earnest until after 1945. So he has really been at it for only 35 years. In that short time, he has pioneered a new kind of factual interest in the Neolithic Revolution of the Near East, he has proven that the interdisciplinary and regional approach to archaeology, regardless of the time range, is the only one that makes sense. He has stimulated his anthropological colleagues and a larger public into understanding the importance of the development of food production to wider issues. And he has broken down barriers between the disciplines that study the ancient Near East. He has not been alone in these efforts, but he has often been in front of others. Sometimes, as Bob Braidwood knows, in front is a dangerous place. But it is the place where the best of the good scholars will always be. So in the end, Bob, because you are amongst the best of the good scholars, and because you are a fine man, we offer you this book, a token of our esteem. Ladies and gentlemen, a book entitled The Hilly Flanks and Beyond, Essays on the Prehistory of Southwestern Asia, presented to Robert J. Braidwood today, November the 15th, 1982, Studies in Ancient Oriental Civilization, number 36, the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago.